So in previous lectures, we've talked about capacitors and switching them in and out. We've also talked about voltage regulators, both those of the substation and those on the feeder, we call line voltage regulators. And in this lecture, we're gonna talk about how we can coordinate these devices together. Um, but before we get into this, uh, we're gonna go ahead and review the, the local controls so you can kind of see where we're kind of coming from as far as using a more of an integrated strategy. And so what we'll do in this lecture, I'll start off by reviewing what I would call the local measurement based controls. That is if we have a control on a capacitor, we have a control and line voltage regulator, what would those controls do? And we're gonna be mostly focusing on capacitor controls. And then we'll look at what I would call the coordinated volt VAR controls which is usually implemented in some type of central logic to this point. So this could be something that runs in the substation, or this could be something that runs centrally on top of a SCADA system. There is also uh, another sort of functionality we want to get out of our volt VAR controls called conservation voltage reduction. And I'll discuss that after we talk about the IVVC type algorithms where we integrate everything together because this is actually kind of a subset, I guess I would say of IVVC in that we wanna to try to reduce a peak power consumption. And then we'll look at some examples in windmill and also open DSS. So the way we have this broken down um, by the video segments is, is shown here. So we'll start in this first segment here, uh, talking about local controls, power factor controls, integrated volt bar control, and then we'll get into some little bit more of a detail of how we do the heuristics. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so for some background, um, you know, say we, we talked about using capacitors before, we talked about using line regulators before, um, but as far as these integrated controls, this is kind of a key smart grid application area. And if you're, if you're going to spend some money and get a good return on this investment, this is typically the application that most utilities look like look at, even more so than doing like automated FLISR. Um, but what we need to understand in order to uh, be able to figure out how these controls work is basically how capacitor banks are used. And we've talked about this already as far as compensating for load bars. Um, we, we've talked a little bit about switch capacitors, but we never really talked about how we actually come up with a control for this. And, and then we could either use localized controllers on each device, or we could use control strategies, which coordinate these devices. And to some extent, you can actually have the local controllers and the centralized controllers kind of be complementary to each other. Um, but we'll get into some different strategies for doing like coordinated control. And the state of the art nowadays is this would be mostly centralized, but we're moving more toward decentralized strategies, similar to what we could have for FLISR, where the devices can talk to each other and actually figure out how to kind of optimize the, the distribution system operation. But I have to say that most of the controls to date are more centralized in nature. So as far as the benefits that we get from this, a lot of the benefits are also the benefits due to capacitor of our compensation. And we talked about this before, but I'll just mention this one more time. Okay, if we have a circuit and we have load power factors that are not unity, then it actually kind of pays to put some type of capacitor bar compensation at the feeder level. Uh, this will reduce the, the I squared R losses because we're reducing the amount of current flowing in the feeders. We're improving the voltage profiles because we get less voltage drop due to reactive power flow. We can also reduce the power demand on generation during peak conditions. So if I'm reducing I squared R, then this is also gonna reduce the KW that a feeder requires at peak and this is important because I'm usually using expensive generation during peak, which I can minimize because of this. We get what's called capacity release. So there's less KVA flowing at our substation on our feeder elements. 
so we can perhaps defer some capital improvements. And then this also helps support transmission. And so if we can minimize VAR flow from generators through transmission to distribution, then this helps us as well during heavy loading conditions. The one thing I want to point out about this, though, it, when we're talking about the benefits of VAR compensation, is we can only get this up to a certain point. And so to the point where we're not pushing VARs back into the grid, we're going to get net benefits in all these different five categories here. However, if you overcompensate and you start pushing bars back into the grid, then you're actually going to see the losses go up. Um, you're maybe going to see more actually more energy consumed by your feeder. And so we can do this up to a certain point, but once we start pushing bars back into transmission, then we're going to lose some of our benefits of doing the capacitive compensation. And so if you think you're going to be able to just boost voltage arbitrarily, I guess you could with capacitor banks, but then you're going to be kind of losing out as far as increasing I squared R losses and other things as a result. So again, what we're trying to accommodate is the fact that load's not a constant on distribution. The, our customers are going to have time varying load, and this is going to vary during the season. This is also going to get vary during as a, as a function of time of day. And so again, I'm showing these two curves where I have a winter characteristic. It tends to peak in the morning, maybe a secondary peak in the evening. I've got a summer characteristic which peaks in the evening. Whether you have a, whether you're gonna see for the given system you're looking at, summer peaks versus winter peaks depends on where you're gonna be um, working at say like in North America. And so if you get to say the more Southern states, you tend to see more of the summer peak. If you're more in the Northern states, the United States, you're gonna see more of the winter peak. In this area where we're at from North Carolina State University, typically what we're seeing right now is we're typically seeing winter peaks, but this could change. This could actually change over time if we think about the fact we're going, we're going through climate change and the, and the summers are getting higher. We could actually get to the point where we actually move more toward a, a summer peak. We'll just have to see. And so when we talked about the benefits of capacitors, we use a simple equivalent circuit. Uh, what we've been using up to this point, even though I have this drawn as impedance, that we've actually been using a lot of constant power modeling. And we've, even been, we've even been using this for our class projects when we're running like windmill studies. Um, if you're gonna set this up in a spreadsheet, you'd have to set up an iterative technique or some type of a load flow in order to solve this particular circuit right here. And so this is the kind of the sample circuit we've been working with before. And what we're gonna be doing is modifying this circuit to show the benefits of the voltage control as well as kind of trying to explain how CVR works. And if you look at the base case with no capacitors, and this is a summer peaking day, what you'll typically see is you'll have a real power profile and then the reactive power profile kind of, kind of follows the real power profile. So this would be what you would have if you would have what we call constant power factor loads. So if real power consumption goes up, reactive power consumption goes up. What we'll see then for this type of a load was we'll see a variation in voltage. So the voltage is shown in this blue curve. And you see when we get up near the peak, the voltage gets depressed. And then as we also approach our peak loads, the current goes up, but the losses go up by the current squared. And so when we hit this peak, we could actually get a lot of I squared type of losses, especially on our main feeders coming out of the substation. When we add the capacitors into the circuit, and we haven't looked at this in conjunction with voltage regulation yet, we'll look at that as well. Basically, this shows a scenario where we have two switch capacitors and it turns out into the light load conditions, there's a benefit for just having one capacitor on, but then once the VARS gets above a certain point, we're going to turn in that second capacitor. What we're doing, as I mentioned in class before, 
is we're trying to squash this VAR profile down, make it as close to zero at the top of the feeder or actually at the substation as we can. And so what you'll see is you'll still see the cyclic variation of the real part of the load, but then the rapta part of the load gets kind of squashed down. And then you, you'll, you should be seeing when you're looking at the voltage and the losses that the losses get dropped. And then we also start to see that we're starting to level out this voltage profile. Now, since we've only got like one switch capacitor and we're not considering voltage regulation, we can only go so far with this, but basically as I add more control, I can keep that voltage more and more constant during the day. So then the question is, well, how do I control the capacitors? How do I actually determine when to switch those capacitors in and out? So that's kind of the, the topic for this lecture. So as far as volt var control schemes that we'll be discussing, we'll, we'll look at the local control. That is, I have a intelligent electronic device on the capacitor bank. It also could have one in the line voltage regulator, which is going to be making decisions based on locally available measurements. I can have the VAR dispatch, which is going to require a one-way communications where I can turn capacitors on or off. We're not coordinating with regulators at this point. When I coordinate with regulators, this is what we refer to as an integrated volt VAR control because we're integrating everything together. So that's sometimes called IVVC. And a subset of this, I guess you could say, would be the conservation voltage reduction, whereby reducing voltage at a certain time, we can actually reduce our peak consumption. So a local capacitor switch control could have many different inputs. Uh, it could be switching based on time. It could switch based on the local measured voltage. This is probably one of the more common schemes. Some utilities have older controls that switch on temperature because the idea would be that as the temperature goes up, air conditioning comes on, you'll have more load, so you should switch capacitor banks on. You can also take measurements of the current and you could switch on current or you can switch on reactor power. So you have all these different sort of options as far as what to base your switching strategy on. So capacitor banks that are switched, the thing that differentiates this from fixed capacitor banks is you still have the capacitor sitting in a rack that's mounted on the pole, but then we would have these switches and these switches have a vacuum bottle inside that's magnetically actuated. And so basically what the magnetic actuation does is using kind of like a electromagnetic plunger mechanism, it opens and closes that vacuum switch. And this is a big improvement over the past where this used to be an oil circuit breaker that would require maintenance. And so these, these um, vacuum switches can operate hundreds of thousands, maybe a million times. Um, before requiring replacement. Uh, this transformer is a transformer it's used to provide control power. So it provides 120 volts not only to the capacitor controller, but also for the actuation elements in, in each of these three switches. And even though I've got three independent switches, I'll typically turn them all the capacitors on and off at the same time. As far as having a current measurement, uh, that adds quite a bit of cost. Now, voltage is actually obtained through the step-down transform used to provide control power. So if I have a conversion from like 7,200 volts down to 120, then I, a lot of times the sensor control, the controller just uses that as a measurement of line voltage. But if we want to do like switching based on current or switching based on reactor power, I have to take line current measurements which get to be a lot more expensive. And then you have to find ways of placing these current sensors on the line. And so those, since those add a lot of costs, you don't really see this used as much. So a lot of different capacitor controllers out there. I, I'd say like the, the least expensive controller would probably be like $1,000, not including the radio. So you have higher end controllers that have a lot of capability like 
the SNC electric or the Beckwith controller, maybe this SCL capacitor controller. Um, then you have less expensive controllers like the Cooper Cannon controller or the HD electric controller that have less fun they have less functionality and so they could be they could be manufactured at lower cost and they're normally they're put into these waterproof cases and they're attached to the bottom of the pole where the capacitor sits so when we talk about having like a voltage control usually what we do is we'll switch the capacitor on if the voltage gets too low and we'll switch the capacitor out when the voltage gets too high and the controller has no way of knowing what would be the proper threshold. And so typically what we would do is we would do power flow analysis for this. And so if you're having your circuit set up in a program like windmill, then what you can do is you could play around with different set points. In this case right here, we're using 122 for the on and 124 for the off. Kind of a tight band, but that kind of corresponds to our class project. And so you can actually set windmill up where it turns on and off for those voltages. And then when you adjust the load in windmill, you could see whether the capacitors are turning on at the proper time or not. So you look at different sort of load steps, you change a load, and you would see whether the capacitors are turning in properly or not. And then you could actually, by trial and error, come up with what these set points should be in the field. And so this is actually based on offline simulations in this case. Once you know what you want your target on and off voltages to be, then when you get to the setup on the actual capacitor controller, and this is an example assuming a Beckwith controller, note what you can do is you can plug in the control open and close voltage. Now this is probably some default values right here. So the open voltage is set pretty high and the closed voltage is set pretty low. Normally you would have this high voltage at a lower value and this low voltage, lower um, closed value at a higher value. But basically you would determine that through simulation using a power flow program. Uh, there's other things you could set in here too, as far as the time delays and turning on off the controllers in here. So if the voltage gets temporarily depressed, you don't automatically turn the capacitor on. You wait for a period of time so the capacitor is not, capacitor switch is not cycling on and off. Uh, the other thing you'll see in a lot of these controls too is this remote control override. And so the idea would be if you did have a central volt VAR control and that central volt VAR control was telling that capacitor to uh, switch off. Well, if the voltage was too low, you don't want to do that because that'll just make the situation worse. And so just in case there's a problem with the SCADA setup or with the volt bar control, you usually have functionality in these controllers that override so the central operator can't mess things up too badly or the controller can't mess things up too badly if the model's inaccurate, let's say. So this is the voltage setup. You, would, you could have time-based switching. You could turn on at a time you think the load's picking up and turn off when the load drops off. This could be used a lot of times where you have capacitor banks near a manufacturer or they have a certain schedule. So you could use time. Or if you have the current sensor, you could do this based on bar flow. And so you basically look at the bar flow and if the downstream bars gets too high, you switch the capacitor in and if, if, if the uh, bar flow gets too low you can you can switch the capacitor off and so you can turn that you could have set points for this and we've kind of got a similar sort of setup capability in open dss where you can have your capacitor switch on off based on the top of feeder bar flow this is kind of what you're doing right here is you're basically looking at bar flow and you're you know if the load bar goes up then you switch the capacitor in if the load bars goes down or maybe even negative, and then you switch capacitors out. So the simplest control we can have is what I would call a bar dispatch. Sometimes people might call this a power factor control. And what we have in the fields, we have various switch capacitor banks available. 
Now, when you're doing this, this is normally something that's done on a substation by substation basis. And so what you're doing is you're, you're wanting to get the total VAR flow at the top of the feeder. And so you can get this through individual feeder measurements. You can add them up or you can maybe have a different uh, relay at the top of the feeder that's looking at the net flow. And the idea would be that if the feeder is starting to consume more VARs, we would switch one of these capacitors in. Now, which capacitor we switch in at what time, we, we usually figure that out using studies, using power flow studies. And so usually you have capacitor number one, two, three, four, and you switch them in in sequence. And then when you're turning them back off again, you just go in the opposite direction again. So you have to have a table set up for what should be the sequence of turning the capacitors on. Normally what we would do is we would be switching the capacitors on at location that will get the best benefit as far as voltage support. And so if we knew if we had all the capacitors off, if we knew the voltage right here was low, then maybe that would be the first capacitor we would turn on. And so you're going to have a switching sequence in this case. And what you need in order to implement this is you need at least a one-way communications. Um, you might think, well, you know, why would you just have one-way communications? Well, this is what we used to have with pagers. You know, it used to be before we had um, cell phones, we had pagers where basically you got a message on your little pager unit. That was a one-way communications link. And so a lot of these older schemes are based on what we call pager communication channels. They're just one-way channels. And they basically just talk to each device. Now, when the capacitor switches on, then what you, you can see as far as the VAR flow is you can see a jump, a discrete jump in the VAR flow at the top of the feeder. And so what we would do is we, we measure the VAR flow. And when I send the command to the capacitor bank, if I don't see that VAR flow jump, according to the size of that capacitor, I know something's wrong. And so this could also be used for diagnostics as well. So this is a basically a control that just monitors VAR at the top of the, the feeders at the substation level and just turns capacitors on and off as needed. This is a example application from a company called um, RCCS. Um, I think they got bought out by ABB but what they're doing is they're monitoring top of feeder VAR flow. And so the real power is in blue, the reactive power is in red. And you can see here if the VAR flow gets too high in this case, um, then what we could do is we can switch capacitors in and out as needed in order to uh, adjust, the, adjust the VAR flow. Um, yeah, so anyway, I pointed to that red, but really the VAR flow in this case is the, is the yellow. And what you would see in this case is you have a certain VAR flow and, you know, the VARs drops down and we could switch the capacitor out. The VARs goes back up, you know, we could switch the capacitor back in. And so anyway, that's what this is doing right here. And you can actually see the detailed SCADA records associated with like the switching events in this case. So we could simulate this in OpenDSS. We can simulate this sort of capacitor control scheme. Um, but this is the real, the real basic scheme that a lot of utilities would, would have. So if we're doing our job right and setting this up, and we're focused on improving the substation power factor, trying to keep the substation power factor as close to unity as we can, we'll end up reducing the electrical KW losses on these feeders, we'll reduce the peak demand on the substation and also on the system. Uh, it improves our situation at the generation transmission level and that we're reducing bar flow. And we're indirectly manipulating feeder voltage when we turn these capacitors on off. But the problem with this scheme is that the control of feeder voltage at certain points is an indirect thing. We can't directly control it. We're basically just switching bolt capacitors in and out. And um, the voltage is going to get boosted, but we can't control the level of, of the voltage boost. So it makes it kind of hard to keep the voltage within a certain range. So a lot of financial benefits from this in terms of dollars per KWH and KW. 
We get some additional information when we see the capacitor switching on and off from the SCADA records. We can tell whether the capacitors are working right or not. But <clears throat> we're not really integrated with our line voltage regulators at this point. The line voltage regulators are doing their own thing. They have a local controller and a set point. But unless we can kind of integrate the control of the regulator and the capacitor, then we're not really going to have the capability of optimizing the circuit. So the next thing would be to look at integrated volt bar control. That is, we're controlling both. And what I mean by voltage regulators is not only the line voltage regulators downstream on the feeder, but we could also include the substation load tap changer. And usually this is done on a multi feeder basis. And so we don't really do this one feeder at a time because feeders could share the same regulator at the top of the circuit. And so if I have multiple feeders, then what I need to do is I need to consider the whole set of feeders because they're all linked together as far as what's bar flow at the substation. So we're going to have control objectives in this case are going to be more sophisticated than what we can do with bar dispatch. We're not only going to meet our power factor objectives, but we're going to be able to keep voltages at loads within a certain set of limits, a lower limit and an upper limit. And we can still minimize energy losses. We can still minimize peak demands in this case, but there's more we can actually do with controlling the voltage profile. And this shows a little figure of what this integrated bolt bar control could look like. So switch capacitors in the field, line regulators in the field. We can tie the regulator control at the substation into the substation automation. We may have some special end of line voltage measurements that feed into this. So we make sure we don't get the voltage too low. We could have what's called bellwether meters. Those are their smart meters associated with advanced metering infrastructure. We don't monitor all the meters, but we can monitor certain meters. And then we can talk to these devices in the field through what we call a DA head end. Now, the reason we may need this DA head end is it may not be possible for the SCADA system to directly ping these devices in the field because we may have like a proprietary communication system. And so they may not be what we call IP addressable and that if we have the IP address, we can ping them as if they're connected into the same computer network. Um, however, if these were all like connected um, where they had all IP addresses and then the SCADA system would be able to directly access these devices. And so you may or may need, not need what we call a DA head end um, to, to basically act as kind of like a go between to, to, to connect all the devices in the field to the SCADA. And then the, the volt VAR control, this could be a separate application on its own server. And it gets all the data from the SCADA and then it sends its switching commands to SCADA and then SCADA would execute the switching commands or change the tap points on the line regulators. So now if I take this simple model that we, we started with, I could add a voltage regulator. In this case, I just put it at the top of the circuit. This, this circuit's not so complicated. So instead of living with a fixed source voltage, I can actually modulate this top of feeder voltage. Uh, so I, I've got two switch capacitor banks still. Let's assume I've got 16 physical taps. I've got a 10% boost capability. What this means, I'll have a resolution of 0 0.00625 per unit. I can also control the capacitor bank states as well. And two means are both on, one means just one's on, zero means are all off. So <clears throat> if I am going to have the capability just in this voltage, well, what would be a simple thing I could do? Well, if this load gets high, and if I know I have low voltage here, what I can do is I can boost this voltage regulator up just a hair. And so this is what you see in the simulation where here's real power. Here's reactive power. The reactive power is going to change 
according to the capacitor states. But now what I'm doing is I'm adjusting the tap position up and down. So in the morning when the load's low, I can keep this tap at a lower level. And when the load picks back up, then I could set the tap higher so I get more voltage at the load. <clears throat> now what we see in this case is we see a little oscillation in the tap change. What we're seeing is we're seeing an interaction between the regulator, the voltage regulator and the capacitor banks. And this is what we, we would need to be able to coordinate in a good control system. And so I'm continuing to flatten out the profile, the voltage even more, which is a good thing. And then I'm, um, if I do this right, I can maybe get a little bit more peak loss reduction as well. So let's stop here for this segment and we come back on the second segment, we'll get a little bit more into the detail on the control algorithms. <laughs>